the debut of the white six on raw i have to say for starters this was an excellent excellent or as i recently saw someone called it a master class so i'll go with that this was a master class as to how you introduce a character physically because it had been teased for what like one to two months if not a little bit more um I don't think I've seen anything like this since Bray Wyatt had introduced the Fiend character. Um, So as I did with that, I watched that. (laughs) When the Fiend debuted, I watched that video several times and I did the same thing with this because I was just so thoroughly impressed with how this whole thing went down. There are a few things that I would have tweaked. I'll get into that in a minute. What I want to say now is, well, before I even say that, the first thing that I thought about when I was watching it, more so the second time, I said, man, I really think that Vince would have probably effed this up had this been under his watch. How? Couldn't tell you. I just had that feeling watching it. Next, what I want to say is that from this debut, WWE cannot fuck this up. This can go either way, hot or cold. You know, everyone's, oh, it started out so well and whatever, whatever. But this right here, this to me is something where if I'm going to, and this obviously we've known that this is months in the works. If I'm going to roll out a character like this, this way, very cinematic, then I have to get like real television or screenwriters on this job like people that you know may have written or that have written for like the walking dead or the, the show for interview of a vamp uh, interview with a vampire or one of the ryan murphy series or um the what the house on uh what's that haunted hill or whatever that that showed us that was on netflix that uh mike what's the face of show i forgot his last name like he, when he rolls out his series every Halloween, like you need like high level writers in order to keep this storyline consistent. I, yeah, I can't fuck this up the way that this rolled out. It took me by surprise. I had not seen any of the the uh, short vignettes. And only thing I think I saw was something. Yeah, I did. And this I like kind of forgot about it, it was something with a psychiatrist. That was it. It was in and out of my brain. I didn't, and I'm cool with it because when it rolled out on Monday, it caught me by surprise. What I would have done though, I I, I, I even skipped, I even skipped the actual intro um, of the show. You know the new WWMCU <laughs> intro, whatever. And missed that until I watched it again. I was like, oh, okay. So with that being said, my little tweaks, so little, little, little tweaks are, well, you know what? Before I even do that, I just want to say kudos for WWE for choosing Nikki Cross for this. Because when they were talking about the firings, She was in the back of my mind. I was like, damn, we haven't heard anything about Nikki Cross. I hope that she's not going to get terminated because she has so much talent. She's so fucking funny. And I know that this is darker, but when I watched her up, up, down, down, she's, she's so funny, dude. She has so much inside her that hasn't really been unleashed. And, you know, and that's just more of a comedic side, but you know, they usually say that comedians, you know, can usually do 
the darker side really well. So we'll see, but I'm glad that she is a part of this. Um, and if everything that I heard is true, um, every time I do these fucking podcasts, these, I always brain fart on the fucking names. Joe Gacy, at one point I was going to do an episode on if Joe Gacy would be a replacement for Bray Wyatt and... You know, I was close enough on kind of on the head. You know, I mean, it's not like any big surprise, but whatever. Um, and Loomis, if that's correct, that was, you know, great selection of a team for people that kind of just went, you know, into the creative black hole. Um, the debut, uh, it made me actually think the way that, well, somewhere Abaddon is pissed. I can tell you that right now. Uh, because the way that Nikki came out is it's very Abaddon. Um, however, the way that she rolled out, it made me just think, you know, did they actually rehearse this prior to not I'm not talking about like at the arena. This kind of felt like it was rehearsed behind the scenes, you know, like, you know, like a dance routine or something to that because it just went like without a hitch. And like I said, I never saw it coming, and the way it played out was excellent, and I don't want to keep repeating that. With that being said, the only things that I suggested to myself was because, I'm not even because, now you're hearing a lot of things. Look, I watched this thing three or four times. And people are like, oh, we saw Carmelo. We saw. I didn't see anything. I saw a dude with braids that looked like Carmelo, but I cannot say that that was Carmelo Hayes. The only person I saw was uh, Gable. I can't even necessarily, I mean, I guess, you know, the, we'll find out whether what this contract thing is and how they're handling that. I'm not going to even get into that. Um, so, anyway, yeah. Look, because I got so much in my brain that's like it upsets me because people stop the bullshit about oh this one it's like whatever. All right, so let me slow down my thoughts. With that being said, when I watched it the first time and it came off right, and then I watched the second time because I watched it like right after it came off, I said to myself, I said, damn, you know what the better setup would have been is. If throughout the show, there were references to people leaving. So right after when McIntyre said, I quit, I'm leaving, you know, when he walked out, talked with Hunter, then Pierce went to go chase him. I mentioned this in an, in an earlier app that I just dropped with Bianca and them. It would have been cool if Pierce took off after him and said, hey, let's just go to the bar and... and Sit down and have a drink on this. And it, all the references of people leaving the building, when you saw um, EO Sky get upset with damage control, when she's like, you know, either things are going to change or I'm going to change, some reference to her, you know, when she walked off, even the girls were like, hey, wait, wait for us, you know, don't don't leave the building without us. So now when you're watching it, because all the questions were, how many people died? Who got hit? And you know, if you had those references, you'd be like, whoa, the way they set it up, you knew that Drew and Adam Pierce bounced out. You heard, yeah, and I don't think, no one would have saw it coming. No, because it just would have been so subtle. No one would have saw it coming. And it just would have been reference after reference. When Liv was teasing Dom and Dom hit the zipper and Damien stopped him, quit screwing around. Yo, come on, we're getting ready to head on the bus, we're getting ready to leave. Boom. Another reference to it. You know, so just throughout, you know, give him his jacket, give me the jacket. Boom, they grab the, the, the vest off of her and they take off. And you just would have heard a number of references about people leaving. Any of you would have did it with Shayna and Zoe. Because um, I think within the interact with Isla and them as well, Isla and Alba, just another reference with that, you know, 
um, since they like doing what I call the, the SNL backstage stuff, uh, you know, I call it the SNL slash Tarantino because I'm trying to figure out if they're messing around with time displacement throughout the actual storylines now. Kind of like how Tarantino does, but I haven't actually locked in to say, oh, okay, this is out of place. Anyhow, um, backstage, you know, even when McIntyre is walking or something, you could have seen somebody else head into the car, something that would just give you reference, little nuances of people leaving the building so that when this hits, and like, oh, they're killing people, they're knocking. You just start counting. This one left. Oh, yo, we looked at it again. And and when Drew McIntyre and Anna Pierce left, you saw such and such car pull off. Shit like that would have been fire because it, it would have really continued. I mean, people are still going to talk about it. But it's these little subtle teas that throughout that when it's going to make you watch it over and over again. And, oh, wait a minute. I just saw, uh, oh, oh, Sonya Deville was there. And she bounced off. Or you saw her in the scooter and took, you know, something that just, you know, or uh, like uh, when you saw Jay um, before his match, he's in the in the concessions, you know, around the fans. Maybe there was something else where you saw Sami Zayn and was like, ah, perfect, perfect point is when Otis and them bounced. Right? We're leaving. We're out. They bounced on him. That's a reference. McIntyre, I quit, but just further like, hey, let's head to the bar so you know he and Pierce are leaving. I just think little things like that, man, would have really like sparked a further conversation when you were like, rather than, you know, when I'm hearing people saying, well, who all died? When once that question hit everyone, you would just start running down the line. Well, we know Drew left because he said this, and Otis and and, and um, Maxine and uh, what's her face Tazawa, we're leaving. We're out. All that just would have added up, and it really would have it would have took it next level, next level shit. You know. Uh, that's all I can really say about that. You know, I just think that just would have really added that, that extra texture to it. The, just the, the, the fact that they showed you the before with Triple H talking to McIntyre and then they come with the after. I wish there was a little less smoke, you know, so you can see a little bit more. Because if you watch it, like I said, I watched like eons, eons of time, uh, eon to- a thousand times. <laughs> You actually see Uncle Howdy almost trip as he's walking toward the camera. You see the silhouette. He turns around. He's walking. He almost trips. I'm not even sure if he noticed if someone was there or if there was a wire. It was just way too, not overly smoky, but a little bit too much dry ice. Um, But that's just really, you know, small shit. They can't, yeah, they, they just, after this, it has to, you know, now I'm wondering, is he, are they going to appear on SmackDown? As far as I'm concerned, this is just my opinion. Take it for what it's, what it's worth. The first person that they should go after is Jay. Everyone has been talking about that and little hints of just the fireflies and the, his music and yada, 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 yada. I've been thinking about doing a side thing on Jay, and it'll be very short, but when you watch, for anyone that watched Raw Talk, to me, one problem with Jay is that he has to, somebody has to sit him down and tell him, brother, you have to go into improv class and step up your promo game. You can't yeet your way through every fucking thing. You got to cut scathing. At this point, if Roman is on his fucking game and then Rock shows up and Rock still shows he's on his game and your main event, Jay Uso, by yourself on Raw without the family, your fucking promos have to be tough. And when he was asked about... What did you think? His response was kind of, you know, it was milk toast, bro. It was, oh, you saw that, huh? You didn't keep that. Dude, I would have been on some look. 
If the Wyatts are here and they're coming after me, let's do it. If they're not coming after me, let's do it. <laughs> you know, to use my other bros, the, the Street Profits, I want the smoke. So it is what it is. But for now, I got to concentrate on money in the bank. Yada, 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 yada. Yeet. Boom. That little breadcrumb right then also goes viral. Like, Jay's not backing down. He's ready for it. He played it the whole opposite. Like, God damn. You know. And look, even if you said, you know, because um, I'm not sure. If Pat McAfee said, yeah. Pat McAfee said he didn't even know. He was, you know, just doing his thing. But I don't know if he was working or, you know, working his viewers or whatever, but let's just say he didn't know. But actually, he had to have known because when I, I'm talking about Jay now, when I watched it again, the way the lights went in before the lights, the security makes sure that they get Jay off of the little thing that he was standing on next to the crowd and he was ushered out. You see him getting ushered out to the side. So, yeah, he had more than enough time to get a promo in gear. At this point, his promos, he's main event Jay Uso. Okay, he's away from his family on Raw by himself. In ring, got it. Promos, you cannot yeet your way every week. You got to be able to cut some people up. Anyhow, with that said, he should be the first victim that they go after with um, Howdy's first promo saying, we got your messages every week, you know, whatever, the Fireflies were calling us, whatever, whatever, whatever. Even mention um, The Fiend, if he, you know, so chooses to, and then calls out Jay, and from that point on, is game on. Even if it affects Jay's money in the bank, um, a cool ass idea would be if let's say Jay wins, you know, Jay wins money in the bank and he has to carry the, the green briefcase, right? Temporarily the briefcase goes missing for like, let's just say like a minute or whatever. They do some magical mystical or whatever. It just goes missing for a second. He finds it casually. When he goes to the, from that point on, when he goes down to the ring, if they're still going to do the yeet shit when the, the lights go off, it's a different briefcase now. And the briefcase now kind of glows because it's usually green. It has some sort of fluorescent color. They can do a lot of fly shit. So now he's like marked without him knowing it. You know, like we see that briefcase. We know we are in the dark. Anyhow, yeah, that would just be a cool ass idea. That's if he is going to be the person that they decide to go after first, if it was up to me. The next thing that I want to address is it's why it's six. I counted five. Me personally, this is just my opinion. I know they're going to do what they're going to do. I wish the sixth person was not Alexa Bliss. I've stated this before and I say it again. I think that Alexa Bliss, I think very highly of her. When it comes to heels, and now I might have to even rethink this, she is the best heel on the female side in WWE. Maybe Rhea, I don't know, because Rhea's getting too much love now. So, <laughs> but because she was, could be very manipulative. Nikki, Nikki, uh, Nikki, Alexa, to me, was the best female heel. When they put her in that brace shit, I always felt it should have been Liv. And it seemed as if, as far as I'm concerned, when you remember when she cut her hair, it was this darker character and whatever, whatever, her ties to the um, rotundas, yada, 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 it should have been Liv. She was already acting like um, a Harley Quinn with the white uh, with the riot squad. It should have been Liv. That's all I'm saying. I didn't. I to this, I do not like Alexa Bliss. It's just a miscasting, you know. As far as I'm concerned, um, I would say 
the sixth person, but this is just me and this is just my imagination. I know it's not going to happen. This is just my imagination. Now with the crossover at TNA, this is the perfect opportunity to tag Rosemary, bro. Oh, oh, oh. That right there could be a banger. If you're really talking about doing business with TNA, that sixth person is Rosemary. Or, if, or even still, somehow there's that crossover into TNA. If that doesn't happen, then that negotiate, that little TNA WWE crossover shit to me is kind of wasted. But it would that's what I would do. I would that's just me. I would bring Rosemary into the fold. You know, I would just you need a voice of reason and it should be Alexa Bliss now being a former cult member or however possessed whatever it is we're calling it in this universe, trying to get Nikki out of it. Um, and I don't even know, I mean, all this is hearsay. I don't even know if she's Sister Abigail. I don't know that. Until I hear them say it on the broadcast, then I, I, it's what it is. Because everyone is automatically swearing up and down. And then all of a sudden they roll out some new names. Then it's like, oh, yeah, you guys were wrong. So that's what I would do. Me personally, I just always felt that she was miscast and she brought that down. She brought the, the work rate of that fiend character down. That's just me. Oh, also, I think a good crossover would be to bring in Matt Hardy and the work that he's because he's in that. the uh, um, What's the. This this. Character of Matt Hardy's, I can't remember. It right now, but he's doing it. The, yes, I knew you come. He's doing that now in TNA. It would make also make a great crossover. And he and Rosemary have interacted. So this is really there. This is really WWE's ball to fuck up, you know, or I should say Hunter's ball to fuck up, whatever it's going to be. I don't have anything else more to say outside of. This was an excellent debut. I can only hope that it gets better. Um, oh, I know what else I want to say, because I was also comparing it with Bray. To me, the Fiend character kind of hit the skids right after The Miz, I think. Right after The Miz, when he went to The Miz's house and yada, yada. Because remember, there was that Every that that you know that the the, the uh, subtext of his storyline was every time he interacts with someone, they go crazy, you know, or they just flip. He was messing with Seth, then Seth went off the deep end. Um, Miz Morrison tried to help him, then Miz flipped, went heel. Um, the only person that didn't go heel was Daniel Bryan, the Daniel Bryan character. Um, but yeah, I feel that after, after what's, but then again, when you watch the documentary, they allude to, you know, he had, and I, and this, this is kind of personal to me, not like, oh, but it's kind of personal because I'm, I'm artistic, I'm an artist. I've worked with a number of artistic people that creatively artistic, not to be confused with autistic. Okay. A lot of creative artistic artsy people that they're too inside their head and they don't know how to micromanage a lot of their creativity so things kind of get mired in oddness and seeing the documentary I always felt that I wish that Chris Van Vliet had the opportunity of interviewing Bray when Bray got terminated you know, but he went inward and didn't wasn't really, you know, doing any into he didn't do any interviews. He do some signings, he meet the fans, the fans pump him up. He had the opportunity to come back, yada yada yada, right? You know, kind of got depressed or got with his bro and started working on shit and whatever, whatever. But he never did that interview. The reason why is because I always wanted Chris to ask him what was gonna be 
the rest of the story? Like, what was your end game? What was your goal? What was your vision for the fiend? And then we could have got from his perspective, the next target might have been Roman. Yada, yada, yada. Before Roman came back and then did the tribal chief, this, that, and the third, or he could have had like a whole list. But when you watch the documentary, it kind of alluded to, I'll say, as if Bray had so many ideas in his head that he would become a temperamental artist and he couldn't, you know, get it all out. And it also felt like before the documentary that it was all Vince is doing. At least that's what I felt from his social media uh, comments and things of that nature. It felt like, you know, the creative team, Vince, was stifling him and yada, yada, yada. But when you watch the doc, it was perceived as if he's so creative that he might be in his own way. And that I know. I know of people that you try to help them creatively and they just will know everything. And it's not like I'm trying to take over. I'm trying to spark your mind. And every time I would suggest something to somebody, they just shit on it and don't allow it to fester in their brain or marinate because fester means negative. It has a negative uh, connotation to it. Don't allow it to marinate in your brain and go, you know what, dude? When you said this and this and this, I thought about it. I don't want to do that, but I want to do this. And that this was sparked by me saying the earlier that, that they shut down. But when you get too many, you know, that that real art, artsy, artsy, I'm so on my way, you know, type of personality, they don't want to take any ideas. Everything has to be their way or no way. And that's it. So... With that said, I kind of lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Um, I know it was along the lines of Bray. Oh, yeah, okay, I remember. Yeah, when it hit the Miz, that's kind of when it fizzled out. It fizzled even faster with the shit with Randy when they tried to burn him up and all that other shit. And that's even in the documentary as well because he did not like being in that suit, whatever, whatever. And that almost felt like a Vince idea. But that's for somebody else to, to break that wall down and explain that to us. But... Anyhow, I don't want to bore you guys. It was a great display, a great, a great, a great, it was a great, (laughs) it was a great display and debut of characters. I really do wish, okay, and I was having another thought. I really do wish, though, they could find a way, even if it's through face paint, that they can keep those fucking masks on. If there's a way that they can create, especially for Nikki shit, because I think she had the craziest, illest disguise, and but but because all of her, her her mask looks white, it looks as if they can just recreate that with just makeup over her face, you know. But I wish that we would never see their faces. That's just me. I wish we'd never see their faces, and they would always wrestle in these masks. Like, um, what was that shitty concept that Vince came up with, Jack and those guys? Those people. Um, yeah, um, that's it in closing. I hope, also in closing, that I hope that all those characters get burned character-wise and in ring to show that they are true, quote-unquote, WWE superstars. With that, I'm going to leave this alone unless something wild, dirt pops up in my head. At, at this point, no. I just wish the best for this, that this only goes upward. And really now is a really good time because Roman's off TV. You know, and by the time they get, I mean, then again, tonight, it might roll over to smack. I don't know. They should just cool out on the Cody, if you ask me, and just focus on Jay. But I don't run shit. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, Candace could be a victim for Nikki. You know, because she wanted to be a friend and Candace kept shitting on her. All right, I'm out because I'll be on this thing forever. Um, let's just enjoy the ride. I'm out. Later. <laughs>